So, for context, my name is Armand Dodgar. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm one of the co-founders and CTO of the Adventure Group. You'll find me all over the internet as just Armand. So easy. For those of you who are new to sort of HashiCorp or have just sort of maybe like one of our tools, the company we focus on entire application delivery pipeline. So the way we like to think about it is three kind of discrete layers. Uh, they're sort of what we traditionally would think of as the operations team's role in terms of provisioning of infrastructure itself. Uh, here are probably most well-known tool is Terraform for provisioning across you know, OpenStack or AWS or Google Cloud or, or whatever across all of them at the same time. Then the next kind of layer in which we think about the delivery process is speaking everything. So how do our apps get the credentials? How do we protect data at rest and in transit? How do we assign identity to our services? Um, and so that's sort of where we think about as the intersection of what our security team might be doing, as well as credentials being consumed by our operators and developers and their, their apps. And the highest level is sort of like the runtime. So how do we run our middleware, our databases, our end applications? monitor it, service discover it, sort of the the above the storage compute and network layer sort of base. Uh, and that's where our scheduler nomad and our service discovery tool console sit. So sort of a broad ecosystem of stuff. Today we're just going to talk about uh, all. So high level agenda, what I'll talk about is like, what are the kind of use cases of all sorts of problems we can solve with it? Uh, then we'll do a super fast drive by to intro to Vault. Um, as well as some of the new features in 07. And then I'll do a super brief demo and hand it over to Nate, who will tell us about what Slack can do. So at the highest level, there's sort of three kind of major drivers we see uh, for Vault. One is really the, I guess the core one, the one that sort of drove us to make Vault in the first place, was the secret management, which is we have all these applications, all these machines, they're spinning up and down all the time. They need access to things like database credentials, request keys, SSL certificates. How are they getting those securely? Right? And in that process, how do we distribute it? How do we update it? How do we audit it? How, how do we sleep at night knowing that this is strewn about everywhere? Sort of related to that is the privilege access management problem, which is great. Our machines and apps need all of this access, but so do our human operators. So if I'm a DBA and I need to do something on the database, or I'm a developer that's trying to debug something, how do I get AWS credentials or database credentials or SSH into a machine? Right? So how do I get sort of privileged access uh, to systems that I maybe don't need access to on a regular basis? And then sort of in the middle is encryption as a service, which is great, we have all of these applications, we have all this data, how do we protect all that data, right? So as data flows between many different apps, it's either in transit in our network, it's at rest in databases, or in S3 and all over the place, how do we protect that data everywhere? So, you know, we talk a lot about secret management uh, over and over with all three of those use cases, but it helps to sort of ground us in what we mean when we talk about secret management. The sort of first question there is start with word one. What is a secret? What are we managing exactly? And the way we think about a secret is it's anything that could be used to authenticate or authorize. Right? So for example, username and password, I'm using it to log in or authenticate myself. Uh, API tokens, similar type of thing. Uh, TLS certificates, I'm using to present sort of my identity, which might be used to authorize my, my access, et cetera. Sensitive is a little different, right? It's sort of a great below secret in the sense that it doesn't directly grant me access to anything, right? It's social securities, credit cards, emails. It's sensitive information, but I can't you know, typically just log in with an email by itself. I can put sort of corresponding other, other pieces of information. Wow. And so the reason we think about these things as distinct instead of just saying, like, why not just treat it all as a secret is the orders of magnitude are very, very different, right? So a secret, I might have... You know, realistically, for most organizations, hundreds or, or maybe a thousand pieces of things like that at that sort of outside edge, maybe a hundred thousand. Versus sensitive information, you could easily imagine millions, tens of millions, billion uh, of pieces of sensitive information. So the scale at which you're managing these two is very different. So your approach has to be different as well. So what are some of the questions we have to ask when we're starting to think about secret management? Um, it's sort of the biggest one, the one that sort of kicked our thinking off with Vault was how do our applications get their secrets? Where are they? Where is it coming from? Uh, where do our human operators get those secrets? And is that a different location? Right? Do we have a split definition of you know, the apps get one set from some source and the operators get it from a different place? How do we update those secrets? What do we do when we need to revoke them? Right? Like if we believe. 
case something's been compromised. Um, when were those secrets used? Do they have auditing or compliance requirements? And sort of like the kind of the question that drives a bunch of meta questions is like, what do we do in the event of a compromise, right? So like, if we ground ourselves in that perspective of like, assume worst case scenario and then back out to what you wish you'd done before then, right? Like, that's sort of the the question that the pokes. You. And so the state of the world that we generally see, and we can all admit to it, because we've all done it to various degrees or continue to do it, is secret scroll. Is that we define the secrets everywhere. They live in GitHub, they live in Puppet, they're in wikis, they're in Dropbox, they're on sticky notes. It's distributed everywhere. There's a decentralization of the material. And so the challenge with that is it's very hard to really understand what your surface area is. It's very hard to manage all of this content. You have very limited visibility, like who double clicked the file in Dropbox? You know, who knows? Um, and there's a very poorly defined break class. So if we do believe, right, if we're asking that question, like, what do we do in a compromise? The answer is very complicated to answer in this sort of form. So InterVault, this is sort of where we started off, you know, even, even HashiCorp's journey. Uh, we, we committed all those sins. And we said, how do we fix this? How do we get away from this? Um, and the first and most important one to us was centrality, right? Like the decentralized nature was what made every other question so much more challenging to answer. So how do we get to a centrality of management? So there's a single source of truth for our humans, for our apps, for our machines. And we only have to sort of reason about one system, right? Or part of only one system. So it was necessary from the get-go that we have programmatic access for applications because uh, we want to be able to automate our deploys, automate you know, all sorts of security processes, especially things like key management. And then for our operators, how do we make sure the manual access isn't like, inordinately painful, right? And the reason for that is there's this sort of practical security consideration, right? which is you can make things ultra secure by just making them impossibly difficult, right? And then what will happen is people just skip it, <laughs> right? Like the default is the work is going to be done. The question is like, is it going to be done securely or not, right? So it's like, can I use Vault to store the secret? Or is that so onerous that I'm just going to paste it and hard code it into my app file because like, fuck, right? Um, and like, that's what often happens because the answers are so complicated. So the practical security aspect was very important to us. Uh, and then the last one is modern data center friendly, which is the answer can't be buy a bunch of hardware because if you're running an AWS, you know, you're not gonna just like mail them a bunch of security appliances and be like, please plug it in. So stepping back from sort of its goals into then how do we design and build a system to do this? There's a number of key features for Vault. Uh, one is just plain old secure secret storage. I want to securely put a thing in there to make sure that you know it's done safely. Um, then sort of building from that is this notion of dynamic secrets, which we'll talk about. It's a way of sort of generating credentials on demand. And the idea there is to give us a lot more fine-grained visibility in terms of who's using what, how do we renew it, how do we revoke it, how do we have sort of uh, more control over the life cycle of, of access. Uh, and then auditing and ACLs, uh, sort of bread and butter for any security thing. And then we'll talk about multiple client authentication methods. This is really important, getting back to that goal of there's different code paths into this thing, right? There's automated systems that need to get in. There's also humans that are manually approaching the system and they want to authenticate in very different ways. So the simplest one is plain old secret storage. I want to make sure that I have a promise that anything in flight to Vault and anything at rest within Vault is encrypted, right? So this is sort of like, you know, table stakes. Um, and the promise here is that everything is AES-256, GCM mode, which is sort of considered state of the art at the, at the time, at the moment. Um, TLS 1.2 is sort of mandated by default between clients and servers, and no hardware required, meaning all of this is just in software. <laughs> So what does this mean if we're actually leveraging this to store something, right? We just want to write a value and have it securely stored. If we're using the CLI, it'd be something like vault write secret foo, bar is equal to bacon. Uh, and if we wanted to pull it back out, we do vault read, right? And so underneath the CLI is just an API client. It's just talking to vault over the network, uh, TLS between client and server. And vault lays out its namespace as sort of a hierarchical file system. So secret foo is sort of directory secret you know, entry foo within it, and then bar equals to bacon is sort of just an opaque value blob. Uh, it doesn't mean anything uh, to Vault. But it might mean something to our app if it was, you know, username equals password equals yada yada. <clears throat> so building on sort of just plain old, I put my thing there and I want to read it later, is leasing. So every dynamic secret in the system has leases, right? And what, what the sort of client contract here is, is 
the secret can be revoked, can be validated by Vault at the end of the lease if it's not renewed, right? And so what this starts letting us do once we have this sort of a contract is it changes the assumption between the client and service, right? So what I mean by that is today there's sort of an implicit lease with most applications. You start an app with a username and password. Implicitly what you've told your app is this username and password is valid till the end of time, right? Like your MySQL password is root, the MySQL you know, user and password is root root. That's valid forever. Never bother to check if that's been updated. Never bother to check for a key role. And so now you have this awkward assumption, which as a security team, I want to do things like say, every 30 days, I'm going to rotate the password. But every app has assumed the password is valid until the end of time, right? So now you're in sort of in a weird bind. So you have to change that assumption. You have to change the contract and say, nothing is valid till the end of time, because that's a really terrible assumption. And leases are a way of forcing this, right? It's a way of changing that, saying, no, there's an explicit contract here. And so secrets may be revoked early by operators. This starts to give us a break glass procedure. So we believe the MySQL system has been compromised. Revoke all access to MySQL, delete all the usernames. And passwords. So how do we make this enforceable, right? If I just give every web server, you know, MySQL is root root, right? How do I enforce that you check in with all every 30 days, right? Like I could just not bother to check in, right? Or I could just, you know, store it once, write it to this, never talk to Vault again. I can't force the app to forget once it's known. So it's not really very enforceable. The dynamic secrets are sort of the way out of it. Instead of ever giving that sort of root credential out, what we do instead is generate the credential on demand. Right? So instead of giving every web server, you know, a thousand web servers, root root as the credential, every web server has a dynamically generated username and password. And now we can uniquely pinpoint this web machine had this username and password. Uh, if there's a compromise, we know web machine 42 uh, is the one at fault. And if we need to do a revocation, we can scope it and say just that one credential. Don't revoke access from all thousand web servers at the same time. The way it works underneath the hood, <coughs> Vault has to be API aware of the underlying system. So me as a user talks to Vault and says, I need my MySQL credential that's read only. I'm just going to do some investigation. You know, I'm a developer trying to debug something. Vault says, great, are you actually able to do this? So are you authenticated? Are you authorized to be able to do it? It generates an audit trail of me doing this action. And then it'll go and talk to you know MySQL and generate you know Vault user dash UUID with password UUID and then hand that back to me as a user. So as a user, I get this credential that I can use to just go talk to MySQL with an unmodified client. My, there's no Vault in my data path, so I'm talking directly client to Vault. But now there is this audit trail. And if I do something bad, that credential can be revoked. Every day when I come in and request it, there's a new audit entry. So you can see, yeah, Armand every day or every week or every month accesses that system to do so. Right, so we have visibility, we have an updating story if we need to change the MySQL password, we have a revocation as well. So like I said, there needs to be sort of an API integration between Vault and the underlying system. It has to know how to like talk to MySQL and generate the sub-credential. So there's a set of pluggable backends that you know, the support is constantly growing over time. And if you want more, just comment by Brian. <laughs> Uh, and today there's sort of a long list. Uh, you know, I use the database as an example because it's sort of such a common one, but it can be things like cloud brokers, right? So AWS, you don't want to really give out IAM tokens, so it can generate sub-IAM tokens or STS tokens uh, that are time bound. Uh, systems like console, right, sort of weird. You might think about console like a database, right? Like how do I restrict access to service discovery and sort of grant you time bounded access to discover a service first? Right, like you can do that with console. And then sort of traditional RDBMS systems, messaging systems like Rabbit, and then some, some more fancy ones that we'll get into later. And then there's sort of the triple A, uh, sort of bread and butter of any security appliance. How do we provide authentication, authorization, and auditing, right? The authentication piece is interesting because like I said, there's two very distinct sort of consumers of all. There's our programmatic applications. They want to be able to use APIs. They're not going to provide a username and password. So they want to be able to do things like mutual TLS, error tokens. We have this sort of app role concept, which is designed for config management. And then there's user oriented. So LDAP, single sign on with things like get not, username and password. The ACL system uh, is unified. So whether you come in as an app or you come in as a person, there's a single rich ACL language. Uh, it defaults everything to deny. So everything is default deny. It forces you into sort of a need to know whitelist. Uh, and this just comes from our experience with running large systems like console, where at scale, it's very, very hard to manage a blacklist. Uh, it's much easier to reason about what you need to know as opposed to what you don't need to know. Sort of negation is 
slash operates. Yeah. We just force that from null. Everything operates like a white list. And the last one is, as you might expect, everything has request response auditing with a system like Vault, um, and it prefers to fail closed. So you can specify any number of sort of auditing syncs for the system. Uh, but if it can't talk to any of them, right? So if it can't get to any of your upstream auditing endpoints, <coughs> then it will just reject the client. For Vault's philosophy is, it's better to fail in a closed way than to service operations that you have no way to audit in the future. So if me as an operator can't go and say, turn off Splunk, go extract a bunch of secret keys out of console, or I'm sorry, out of Vault, turn Splunk back on, and it looks like, oh look, I, I never exfiltrated any data out of the system. <coughs> so a system like Vault, uh, you know, because it's doing things like generating on-demand credentials and sort of in this pre-authentication flow between a lot of things, right? Most of our apps will struggle to operate if they don't have their AWS keys or database credentials or whatever, uh, is very sensitive to available. Out of the gate, support its this HA model, where it will elect an active instance that's servicing all the operations that have multiple standbys, and it will take over automatically on the so That's been there since sort of 0 0.1. Uh, you can use console or zookeeper or etcd, a uh, number of different sort of leader election compatible backends to do that. New in 0 0.7 replication stuff, so I'll talk about that a bit later. This add sort of you know, where active standby helped us within a data center, replication helps us between data. One of the interesting challenges with a system like Vault is if it's promising all your data is at rest, is encrypted all the time, right, at rest and in transit, how does Vault decrypt its own data? Sort of a chicken and egg problem when it boots up itself. Um, you know, one answer would be, well, you just put Vault's key in its config file and there's only one key in one config file. But then inevitably you manage that config file with Puppet, and then inevitably Puppet is managed by configs that are in GitHub, and that lives, you know, that's CI in Jenkins, and now that key exists in plaintext all over. So, you know, a decision that was made very early was that that key has to be provided online to the system. We're purposely going to make it just painful enough that you don't put it inside of a config file. And so the challenge of doing that then is, okay, well, if I'm, you're providing this key to the system online, that key is the master key, right? Like, it is the key to the kingdom. Uh, because it's protecting all your data at rest. So even if the ACL system was like, no, Armon as an operator doesn't have access, if Armon as an operator has the master key, I don't really care about the ACL system, I just decrypt data at rest. So how do we protect against insider threat, right? Like how do you protect me, a malicious key holder, from attacking that data? And the idea here is sort of what's known traditionally as the two-man rule. Uh, it's really multi-person, uh, but comes from sort of the, the kind of nuclear summary days of like, how do you prevent one bad person? It's like, you have two people twist the key at the same time, right? It's sort of like, like classic Red October scene. Exactly, right. <laughs> you need like active inclusion. And so the technique we take sort of scaling it up from just two to sort of arbitrary end. So we use this technique called uh, Shamir Super Sharing, where there's a single set of encryption keys that protect data at rest. They are then protected by the master key. That master key is split into n different pieces, right? And so we never actually hand out the encryption or master key. Then we give out these shares uh, to the operators. And so you can configure it however you like in terms of N and T. But by default, what we say is we're going to generate five and three of which are required to bring to unseal the system. So you need a majority of your operators to conclude against you. You know, if that's the case, you probably have you know a whole lot more problems that, that people unsealing the phone. Uh, and so it seems like a pretty good trade-off. Sort of in summary, what we took a look at with Vault is how do you solve that secret sprawl problem? Right? And there's really two different sort of angles to think about it from a security perspective, which is how do I protect against insider threats, which is the more more common threat, frankly. And you know, most people are not victims of you know advanced persistent threats. So it's really having a fine-grained ACL system with sort of sensible ways of managing things, as well as a secret sharing system to prevent sort of one person having that root of trust. Then protection against external threats just comes from having sort of a comprehensive crypto system and a well-defined threat model of how we manage it. So that sort of answers, hopefully, uh, sort of the secret management and privilege access management questions of like how Vault works. The one that's a little funkier is the encryption as a service. So when we think about sort of the encryption as a service challenges, this really goes back to that split between sensitive and secret. Right? The secret data, that's basically like you just load it into Vault and you know where you can use dynamic secrets, you use dynamic secrets, where you can't you use static secrets, and sort of provides an answer for both machines and operators to, to get access to. 
the middle ground is sensitive data, where maybe I have a billion records. Uh, Vault is certainly not designed to, to store that. Please don't even try. So you need to think about different ways of handling it. So the challenges there is like, A, cryptography is hard, and people tend to screw it up. You know, case in point, uh, you know, things like 1Password and LastPass, which ostensibly have one job, uh, got this wrong and used zero IVs and exposed your encryption keys. So, you know, proof in the pudding that, you know, people whose sole job is this, you know, get it wrong. We get it wrong. That's why we use external auditors and have full external suites and sort of three eyes on changes uh, because it's hard. The other one is, right, even if we get the cryptography right, key management is really hard, right? So, like, how do you actually distribute these keys between all the clients? How do you do key rotation? How do you manage life cycles of those things? Even if we get the crypto right, managing life cycles of keys is itself a terrible problem. So there's a lot of sort of challenges here. And one way we took a look at this was extending the kind of dynamic secret functionality of Vault and adding sort of almost a key management crypto offload feature called Transit. The idea behind the transit backend is that it sees data sort of in transit through the system. It doesn't actually hold on to your data, right? So it can't actually credibly store a billion records, but it could flow a billion records through it over the course of time. And so what we like to do here is have a set of named keys. So I can name my key, you know, web, an API, a billing server, or whatever. And then these keys can be used to sort of do remote cryptography. So I can encrypt data with a named key, decrypt it, HMAC, whatever. And so the advantage of this is, A, my applications never see the key material. They never actually have access to it. It's just held in vault and sort of referenced by name. And it lets us decouple the storage of all of the sensitive data from the actual cryptography. So vault can manage holding onto whatever, even thousands of keys, tens of thousands of keys. Um, but it's not going to have to hold on to the billions of potential records, right? Those are just flowing through vault ephemerally. And so this lets us, our, our applications sort of outsource their secret management problem to vault. <coughs> So in practice, what it looks like is something like this. You know, user sends a request with sensitive data to a web server, let's say. Web server flows that through Vault. It says, here's some plain text. Here's the user's you know, credit card number. Please encrypt it. The Vault you know, verifies we actually have, you know, we're logged in. We have rights to manipulate, let's say, the web key that we can actually do an encryption operation with that key. Um, if so, then great. Uh, we encrypt it, send the ciphertext back, and we have an audit log that's great. The web server encrypted into this piece of information. Then the web server just simply stores the ciphertext in whatever scale out store it wants. So maybe we're using DynamoDB, we're dumping it into Hadoop, it's going into a database, whatever. Whatever our sort of data scale out strategy is, we use that in place, right? It just so happens the data is now encrypted. The reverse flow I didn't document, but you might imagine is almost effectively the same thing. Pull out of the database, flow it to a vault, say, here's ciphertext, give me plain text back, decrypt with the same key, and you know, then provide the sort of plain text result back to our user who expects uh, you know, their, their input and output to sort of be the same. That was sort of high level drive by. Apologies for sort of the, uh, the drive by nature of it. Uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time sort of the new features in Vault 07 and touching a little bit on 065 as well. So the big, big new one is really replication. Um, what it adds is a primary secondary model. So sort of similar in the same vein as what we had with kind of the active and standby. There's one active and any number of standbys. There's one primary and any number of standby clusters. So the reason for this is the primary axis are source of truth. It's sort of authoritative as to like what everything should be. And it prevents sort of a, a conflicting model where, you know, well, in an active, active scenario, you, know, you might have two rights that disagree and now you have to reconcile it. Uh, which is, you know, problematic if you have things like encryption keys, right? It's very hard to reconcile two random encryption keys. And then you have any number of secondaries, which are mirrors of the primary. So the real two goals in doing this is multi-data center availability. So if I'm spanning multiple regions and I lose, you know, either connectivity or I lose that whole, you know, data center, you know, does that mean my global deployment that depends on both now goes offline, right? So like, how do we solve that availability problem? The other one is request scaling. So if we're using Vault to do things like encryption offload, we might be doing thousands, tens of thousands of requests per second. Uh, and so, you know, one poor active instance is going to struggle to keep up with us. So how do we spread that load across multiple clusters? So at its core, the design sort of uses an asynchronous uh, sort of assumption. Uh, the reason is really prioritizing availability over consistency, right? Like we'd ri rather writes continue to succeed at the primary and the secondaries eventually catch up and block any transactions of any secondaries offline. Uh, it should be transparent to our clients. So any client that works with Vault will continue to work with Vault. Uh, reads are serviced locally, writes get forwarded transparently to their primary. 
So under the hood, the implementation looks very much like you know, if you read the how does a database replication sort of page work. Uh, it operates very similar to databases. It uses write ahead logging uh, on the primary to know sort of what's changing, and it ships those logs down to its secondary stations. If it gets arbitrarily behind, so we run out of wall logs to actually ship to our secondary site, then it switches into a more expensive sort of index-based reconcile of what has diverged on the two sides, sort of gets the secondary close enough, and it switches back into log shipping. And then there's a number of sort of techniques to recover from, you know, what if we lose power in the middle of a transaction, <coughs> similar to sort of a database, how do we sort of get the system back into a consistent state uh, that uses an Aries technique similar to like Postgres or MySQL. So at the sort of highest level, what this looks like, a 10,000 foot view is we might have our primary cluster and our secondary cluster. Within each of those, we have our active and standbys, and they're sharing access to a data store, maybe console, maybe something else, doesn't matter. Uh, and then they're, they're performing log shipping and sort of the happy path. So the happy path is we're just shipping logs. It's you know, very, very nearly real time and, and how close the secondary is. If we get really badly out of sync, like I said, we'll switch into this more expensive reconciling index to figure out what's actually diffed. Uh, and how do we get back there? Uh, and then you know, switch back to log shipping when we're all happy. The next major overhaul has really been sort of on the UI side. So it's had sort of a an exploring UI for just static secrets and sort of the privilege access management side. Now with that, it's sort of the replication management side of things. Uh, so you can sort of just point and click your way into having a replicated cluster. Then moving into sort of the ACL stuff. So this is this is where things get kind of cool. Uh, the very nitty gritty of all access control is for the, the sort of ACL system uses kind of a capability model uh, to say, okay, great, maybe on path secret foo, I want to grant you know one user the ability to create that. So if it doesn't exist, I'll let you create secret foo. But maybe a different operator has access to update it. So they can't create new things arbitrarily, but I can update their value. A third person maybe has read-only access, right? So you have this very fine grained model for who can create, who can read, who can update, who can delete, so on and so forth. But what if I want to even go further and say, I'm going to restrict your ability to create to sort of sub parameters, right? I don't want you to be able to create any arbitrary secret. Maybe you're only allowed to create things that have the field username and the field password, as opposed to putting bars you can debate. In there. So what we now extended the ACL system to do is give you can sort of give it both a whitelist and a blacklist uh, that both apply in addition to the existing controls. So sort of a, a concrete example of what we might want to do is going back to sort of the key management system. <coughs> So maybe we have the endpoint, you know, transit keys, you know, stars, where we can sort of star as the name of the key. And we have the ability to create these keys. But I want to go even further and say you're really only allowed to create an AES type key uh, as opposed to maybe, you know, an elliptic curve or something else. And I'm not going to ever let you just, you know, create a key that can be exported from the system. So there are situations where you want to be able to key that you can, you know, export. Maybe you have to have interoperability with some other system that doesn't understand all, and then you'd be able to share keys. But in this case here, I'm saying, you know what, you're never allowed to create an exportable key, this key never leaves vault. And so we can sort of go even more fine grain on terms of when I'm creating that key, what I can do. In a similar thing is, you know, a feature vault has had is the ability to sort of wrap a response. So instead of saying, you know, I can say read secret foo and it gives me the answer. I can say read secret foo, but don't give me the answer. Give me sort of an, a token that indirectly lets me read the answer. The idea is if I have sort of a trusted chain of things I need to sort of thread the value through. So for example, you know, maybe my chef server is going to read from Vault and get it. It's going to then pass that value to a chef client. That's then handing it ultimately over to an application that's going to read my secret. I want to make sure that, you know, that secret was never exposed to chef server and the SSH daemon and the chef client and some, you know, other wrapper scripts on that machine. That the only two points that I ever saw were Vault and the target end application. And so by sort of wrapping it in this one-time use sort of cubby hole is the, is the way we explain it, is those, like, once you open it, it evaporates. So if the chef server tried to open it and tamper with it, it's never going to get to the end application, and it's evident in the modif log that it's been tampered. And so this has been a parameter. You can make a request of all and say, I'd like my response wrapped. But there's no way for me as a security person to say, no, no, no. Anytime you do an operation, it must be wrapped. Reject the request otherwise. And so now what you can do is set a minimum and maximum wrapping TTL, where basically if you have any minimum, you're forcing the wrapping. You're saying it, it has to be wrapped. So an example of this might be, you know, maybe I'm going to give you the ability to generate a root certificate authority in the system so you can create a, a, an exported, you know, PKI root, 
Uh, but I'm going to say you have to wrap it minimum value 15 seconds, maximum value 300 seconds. So you know, it's going to thread only through to the, to the target end. And so with that, you know, oh, I, I put these in the wrong order. But I'll, back. I'll just get forward and come back. So with that, let's say I generated this one-time token. It's restricted in the sense that only one person can do that read. But then how do we sort of verify in the audit logs whether this has been violated? Uh, before, it would require some sort of elaborate stitching together to figure out, okay, you really only were supposed to use it once, and it was actually requested twice, and sort of not obvious. Uh, so it's kind of hard to audit. So now there's this remaining uses that makes it super obvious in the audit log uh, as to like what's happened with this thing, right? And so you can sort of follow it in the audit log much more easily instead of reconstructing it. All right, these were out of order, so let me just get back. So the next sort of interesting change is the SSH backend. So sort of in line with kind of the dynamic secrets and brokering access to databases is what if we broker access to SSH into machines themselves, right? So typically what we see is you know, every developer's public key is installed on every single developer machine or every developer has the master pen that lets you SSH into everything. Uh, both of these are bad for very obvious reasons. So what Vault has traditionally let you do is sort of two modes. One is dynamic RSA, where it will dynamically generate a new SSH key, hand one side to you, SSH into the very machine, and install that as an authorized user, so that you can use that newly generated dynamic key. The challenge there is generating keys chews up a whole lot of entropy, uh, so it can be quite slow. The other approach is a one-time password. So when you basically are allowed to SSH, it'll just generate a random password, and an agent on the target machine will call back to verify, yes, this one-time password is actually correct, and then it evaporates. Uh, the issue there is you need sort of an operating system-specific integration to do that callback. So the last one, the newest mode, is Vault acting as a specific authority. So the way this works is developers all still have their SSH keys, but now when they want to SSH, that flows to the Vault story and say, please sign my SSH keys, right, with Vault's public certificate authority, uh, and maybe the expiration of the signature is only 30 seconds. So sign it with a valid signature for the next 30 seconds. Uh, if I'm allowed to do that, I get my received signed key back, so now it's signed by Vault, and then I SSH in normally, but now with the signature on my SSH key. So now what the target server does is just verify, great, Armand has this valid key, it looks like it's signed by Vault, and I've been set up to trust Vault signatures, looks good, allow the SSH to happen. So the sort of advantage with this approach is that the client only has to communicate pre-flight, there's just that communication to get the signed key first. Uh, there's very minimal computational overhead, so as opposed to dynamic RSA, which actually takes multiple. If you've ever ran like SSH key gen, you know, like, why is this thing actually slow? Uh, it's because it's chewing up a bunch of entropy. Uh, and so it'll do the same thing on Vault side, so you don't need to deal with that. There's no OS integration like we have with OTP, no agent really required. And so it's a very simple and secure way to sort of broker the SSH access without a whole lot of work of change. And batched encrypt, decrypt, this is just getting a bit more into the sort of practical of if you're doing a lot of sort of flows of data through Vault. Uh, you know, oftentimes what we see is, you know, maybe rendering one web page actually requires decrypting five to ten pieces of user data for servicing that web page because uh, it's sort of denormalized in the database. Oh, yeah, yeah. I should say it's normalized in the database. Um, and so we'd like to be able to just shed, send all of that to Vault in one go as opposed to having to do, you know, ten back and forths uh, to render the web page. So this is just basically extends all of the existing endpoints to let you do a batch version of it. So instead of saying, like, here's the plain text, here's you know, a list of plain text, and get a list of ciphertext. This one. And then a handful of new backends. So if you use Okta for authentication, now you can use that. Radius, uh, you know, if you're going super old school. And then uh, ED, uh, etcd v3's API, which is a pretty significant rework. Uh, it now works as a storage backend, so if you want to use that as cold storage as opposed to fossil, yeah, to. So I have a super brief demo, uh, just on the replication encrypt as a service bit. So what I'm just going to do is start two independent in-memory vault clusters. So vault has this sort of super simple like vault server dash dev mode, which just starts. Well, I need to set the mind address different. But basically, you just type that, it just starts an in-memory vault. So it just assumes, like, if you're using this for development purpose, I don't need to bother persist. Uh, and it just keeps things in memory. So what I've started in the other two tabs, I just save myself from typing the different bind addresses and, and the tokens. It has two different vaults, so they're just independently running right now. They're in dev mode. You, know, you can see it's just uh, running in memory. 
so they're completely independent, not synced to each other at all. So totally independent right now. And what we're going to do is actually first I'll just mount some random thing. I'll add the AWS backend. We'll see that how this thing gets wiped out in a second. So I'm going to set up vault number two as a secondary uh, to the primary. So right now they're, they've diverged, they've been initialized, but number two, for example, has the AWS backend of the primary. So I'm just going to go in and set up set up the, you know, number one as a primary. Right now it's just not running replication at all. So great. It's now thinking about itself as a primary, which changes the way it sort of indexes and manages some of its data. We're going to generate a secondary token. This lets us authenticate the other vault against this one. We start, the, we start having it slave against it. We have this token ready, ready to service that secondary. Come over here. Basically say, I'm going to be a secondary. Here's your token. Off to the races. So it takes a few seconds and it sort of reconfigures itself to, to mirror what the primary looks like. Uh, but if we go back, it should have already removed. Oh, I guess not. Not there. I'm going to just cache the browser. So the AWS backend is gone, so it's sort of mirroring now what the primary looks like. So here we're just going to mount new backend transit, which is the sort of key management one. Down to here, and we'll come in and create a new version key boot. Whatever matter. And I'm just going to encrypt my name. So let's just say I consider my customers' names to be sensitive information, encrypted. Now, if we come back to the other site, so what we see is that our transit backend has already been mounted over here. So it indicated over that we were enabling some new backend functionality on the course of cluster. Uh, key, encryption key foo is visible, so it's replicated the key over. I'm just going to paste in the ciphertext that cluster one generated, encrypt it, and get Arma back. So the best way to think about this is sort of like, yeah, it's sort of maybe trivial if they had to replicate our keys from, you know, my machine running on one port to my machine on a different port. But now if we sort of step back to like the real use cases, I have data center one in the US, data center two in the UK, and they're encrypting and decrypting a sort of shared corpus, right? A shared set of customers. How do we replicate these keys between them and make sure that we can be encrypting and decrypting data, you know, being generated in different sites and have this actually like work without a really complicated story around like this piece of this customer's data was encrypted by the you know the Hong Kong data center, so you can only decrypt it by the keys that exist in Hong Kong. It gives us sort of a unified approach to the encryption as a service. So that's all I had as a demo. Thank you guys for uh, for uh, taking through. Thank you. Just a few minutes if you want to like, grab drinks, go to the bathroom, whatever, we'll switch over to the presentation. Nate, he'll tell us about what they're doing at Slack. Okay, so uh, first I want to say thanks to HashiCorp and uh, Spatial for having us here today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we deal with secrets in Slack and uh, people. Uh, but first, about me, I'm what some might call a traditional kind of DevOps engineer. Most of my career has been spent doing this big backend system, scaling them out. Uh, about two years ago, I joined uh, Slack on their engineering team. I was the second engineering hire. And uh, doing the same sorts of things, just as a big security. Uh, so, first off, who here doesn't know what Slack is? Yay, everyone knows. <laughs> Uh, so back to this version of Slack, uh, we're in the best situation with our CD. Norman's kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, basically, we had a handful of ways to deal with them, but for the most part, the secrets were just laying there in code. Uh, uh, a number of repos, each one of them had code for uh, secrets around all of these things. And it certainly wasn't great. And we knew this was bad, uh, but it wasn't really a priority. It was a lot of tech debt and we were really focused on building uh, building Slack, making it big, acquiring users and companies that were good, uh, rotating secrets and solving the problem, not hard for one priority. Uh, but then we had a breach. Uh, does anyone remember we had a breach? Well, okay, one person. Uh, back in 2015, there was an issue. Uh, 
got it online. I'm not going to go into it here. Uh, but it was kind of a, a good thing. Uh, they managed to lift the code base, or at they lifted the code base, and they got a lot of secrets to them. They had to go through and rotate all the code. Well, now it became very apparent that it's actually solved this. want to rotate all the code. Just stick it right back in the code base for that. Uh, so, just a quick people can yell out numbers. Uh, how many tools have you existed to solve this problem? And it's three. Three? One person said three. That's, that might be right. We uh, we looked at two. Uh, Keywiz is one. Uh, everyone's heard of this, maybe. Uh, and it was pretty interesting looking at the time. Uh, it appeared to have everything that we wanted first uh, central storage. You know, a quick change, break glass procedure. It was uh, secure and it had seamless integration with a lot of the applications. You know, just exposing files on the these files and uh, But when we started to dig into it, we noticed that there's a real lack of documentation and that keeps files. Then uh, we, we stumbled upon both and it became very apparent that it was everything that Key was offered plus more. And Arm spoke a little bit earlier about all the dynamic rotations that were involved, and that's what pretty much drew us towards the product. It was very interesting in terms of uh, breaking glass and managing secrets. Uh, it made us feel really good. Yeah. And of course, we could have embarked on the journey of building our own, but no one needs to do So obviously, we chose Vault. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit about how we actually administer it. First off, uh, if you've ever seen a talk that I've given or my uh, colleague Ryan, you probably recognize this slide. What we're doing here is, or what this is showing, is we've got a separate AWS account. We call it SecOps. Uh, very few people have access to this account. And the point that we're, that we're trying to, or the, the goal that we're trying to fulfill is that uh, we can put highly sensitive things like faults or uh, audit ingestion stuff for our production infrastructure. And almost no one's going to be able to get to it or see it. Uh, our ops engineering don't have access to this cluster. It's very <coughs> locked down. Uh, from there, we, we decided to go with console, obviously. Uh, Vault was built with console in mind. I think at the time, it was the only one that offered high availability. And that's something that we definitely wanted to do. Uh, we run five nodes, uh, five wide, and we put console and Vault on the same. Uh, machine and the reason that we chose to go five wide is we're in AWS for USC spot for four availabilities. Uh, four doesn't give you a quorum though, so we just bumped it up to five. Now we got a quorum and we're isolated from a single easy failure. Uh, that's not unheard of in AWS, they tend to come and go on occasion. Uh, so, who here is running Vault actually already? One person, maybe. Great. Uh, do you have audit logging enabled, sir? Uh, recently. <laughs> oh. All right, well, that's good. I was going to say, if you don't, you should leave now and do it. Um, it's very important to have this audit trail. Uh, you don't want people to be lifting tokens from your machines, authentication credentials from users' laptops, and talking to people, exploiting secrets. Uh, the one kind of bummer about uh, the audit logging that we've seen, it's not all that terrible, was uh, one day we had a problem and we had provisioned a number of machines and they started to generate about 40,000 requests a second into Vault. And we only had one audit endpoint enabled. And so this, uh, the poor Vault master was writing the devlog. And devlog's a Unix dgram and there's only a so big a queue size it, it can handle. Uh, Vault was definitely filling that. And as Armin said earlier, it's a fail float. Vault started to suicide. Uh, of course, that cost leader election. The whole thing just cascaded into failure. What we did to solve it was to move over to the socket out of hand. Uh, for that, we can flip on TCP, we configure our syslog to adjust on back for just some random port. And uh, everything worked. We verified we could still ingest about 40,000 bits a second or more. And it was a great lesson learned. Uh, we now know kind of number bound. 
of when Paul's going to maybe start showing some signs of uh, <clears throat> So the other, the other bit here is off. And for the most part, we're using the app ID off backend. And I know that's been deprecated now. It's Apple. Uh, but when we started on Vault, it was on like 013, version 013. And, uh, and Apple uses but uh, we were trying to move over to AWS EC2 auth, but that's taking a little bit of care. Uh, it's a little high touch with our operators to get Chef to play nicely or provisioning service to play nicely with, with that backend. Um, but in general, uh, you want, you want app ID is working great because it's not easy. Uh, oh, we have also, every machine logs back in about every two weeks or so. We don't do token renewables or anything like that. We actually log these machines back in every two weeks take those credentials. Uh, you know, if, you, if you go onto a machine and steal your token, the machine token that's going to burn in a, a couple of weeks, you won't be abused anymore. Uh, for mounts, it's pretty uninteresting here. We're really only using two. We've got uh, the generic, we call it static, uh, or the PKI and, or the PKI backends. And uh, what we've done is kind of segment our mount structure into a top level of project and environment. So we have like web server dev or prod. And then under that, we mount all the backends to that project and environment. I'll see that the first time I'll think of Eric or PKI. Uh, <clears throat> I think we have somewhere north of 60 backends mounted right now. Uh, it works fine. Paul doesn't complain. Uh, the PKI side, we're doing pretty short lived certs. I think. Uh, the shortest ones are four to eight hours, and the longest ones are about two weeks. Uh, we renew those certificates about around the half life. Uh, the goal or the idea there is that we want to have enough time to recover from an outage, uh, but we don't want to leave too much time. Uh, you know, to, we don't want to leave too much time uh, that someone can steal the credential and become useful. Uh, for the generic backends, uh, we actually use TTLs. Uh, this caused some problems that I'll talk about later. I think this changed now. There's a refresh interval on the generic backends. Uh, but the reason we're using these, uh, these short TTLs on the generic, the generic backend is to force our client machines to redo those secrets every so often. Uh, we do it four hours. If we need to rotate a generic secret for whatever reason, we'll be sure that within four hours, every machine's going to get a new copy of that. Uh, for roles and policies, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it maps very closely to uh, the backend. Uh, web server dev has a role in the app ID sense and the policy name on the exact same thing. Uh, we try to keep everything one to one. Uh, we don't we get into this weird situation where we're crossing down. Uh, so a little thought exercise. Let's say we have the tools in a web server project. Uh, if the tools project needs to access or share a credential with the web server project, uh, we could do a number of things to facilitate that. One is to add the web server policy to the tools rule, which basically deputizes tools to become a web server. Uh, the other is to modify the tools policy to give it access to the uh, web server mounts. Uh, or, and what we settled on doing was to, uh, or, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the final solution was to duplicate the credentials. Uh, you could copy the web server cred into the tools mount, and that's obviously terrible. Uh, so what we ended up doing was modifying policies. Uh, and the reason we went with this was because it takes effect immediately. If the tools, uh, if a tools machine needed to access this new credential and web server and you modify the policy, <coughs> it's, all, it's already there. Uh, if you do it with the app rule, you have to re-log the machine in. If you do it uh, with duplicating, well, just ask for a rule. Uh, and then in backup restore, this is incredibly brain dead simple. Uh, console snapshots, GPG it, shove it in S3, restore, same thing, just the other way. It takes just a couple of minutes. Uh, see how much I can host. So, uh, so that's a little bit on how we administer Vault. Let's talk about how we use it. So, going back to the app ID auth stuff, we have to bend it to do our bidding. Uh, 
And you know, as I mentioned, we started in version like 0.13 uh, when we deployed our first production cluster. I had you know, built Vault in my home directory with a couple of modifications and shipped out to some servers and did some stuff up to test. And, uh, it was the early days. But to get App ID working for us, uh, we came up with this kind of convoluted multi-phase approach where basically we have a minter token that can create one-time use subtokens. And those subtokens are only allowed to write app ID registrations back into Vault. Uh, the minter token itself doesn't have that power, and the subtokens burn after the first use. And we do this with a bunch of policy trickery. I recall I worked with Armin to figure out how to get this to actually behave the way we wanted it to. Uh, it might be better now, but this is how we're doing it. And if you want to know about the policy trickery, you can talk to us later. Uh, from there, everything ends up in a temp FS. And this is kind of borrowing from keywords, really. Uh, we created a RAM disk or a temp FS and, uh, and mounted it. And uh, we have a number of things that render to it. And the reason that we you know, didn't go with keywords and we chose to do well with the temp FS is that the temp FS is guarded against doom killer. The fuse file system, not unless you go and configure that to be the case. Uh, so as I said, uh, console templates, one of those things rendering down to the tempfs, and it's been a godsend for us. If you're not using console template, you definitely should be. Uh, it can understand vault leases. It smartly decides when it should renew credentials and do all these sorts of things. Uh, for us, we put the templates in the repos uh, nearest the projects that consume the credentials. Uh, and uh, we actually have console template render down to a hidden directory in TempFS. And from there, we run a bunch of lint scripts. You can check the site, make sure it's a valid PHP, valid shell. Uh, if it is, then we modify the permissions, stick it in the right spot in TempFS, and let the application you know, decide to pick up those changes. Uh, we also use uh, console template once quite a bit. And the reason behind this is I broke the website one time. And the reason I broke the website was I deployed a bad template. That bad template got on Scratch. All of a sudden, the secrets were gone. This kind of predates our linting checks as well. But uh, we use once to verify that the template is actually going to render. We do the same lint checks. And if everything's good, then we allow things to get deployed to prod or allow the build to be uh, passed as a success. <coughs> We also use a fair number of shell scripts. Uh, one of them is to actually talk to the PKI backend. Uh, we wanted to have a lot of control around when we renew certificates. And we also are currently having Vault issue our private certificates, or our private keys, as well as certificates. And uh, as I know, console template doesn't really play nicely with something that's going to end up generating two files from a single, uh, from a single uh, template. So we did it with a shell script. Also, the auth dance is based on a shell script. The API is RESTful. So now I've got a couple of fun anecdotes about Vault and Slack. Uh, a number of times now, we've run into situations where a bunch of leases have taken it down. Uh, mostly, this is self-inflicted. As I mentioned earlier, we set TTLs on the generic backends. Uh, well, that used to create a lease every time a machine checked it out. If you've got 7,000 plus machines, and they're all asking for you know, secrets generating leases. We're also logging machines back in with that ID. Those are generating leases. Well, Vault needs to revoke those leases at some point. Uh, on a number of occasions, we've had Vault <coughs> try to revoke close to 14 million leases. Uh, this doesn't go so well. Vault starts to miss heartbeats, loses its leader status, they have a leader election. What happens when a new leader is elected? They try to revoke leases, rinse and repeat. Uh, pretty much each time we've reached out with Apache Corp and we figured out, okay, what we're doing is kind of bad. We had to take manual steps to, uh, to fix it, go into console, manually delete these empty records. Uh, but a lot of this has changed. Uh, our last revocation storm wasn't actually a problem. It was just a big block in the uh, in the error log. Uh, things are a lot better now. I, I think today we're hovering around 70,000 active leases. So, so far, probably 14 million we had way back when. Uh, 
it's upgrading. It's been an absolute breeze. Uh, certainly, if you're using console, uh, like I said before, restoring console is incredibly simple. Uh, what we do when we want to upgrade: go grab a production snapshot, boot up a couple of machines, uh, get console running off that snapshot, launch the new vault uh, version, run some sanity tests, make sure everything is good, go to production. This is only couple. Generally, we do this in about 30 minutes. From the moment that I decide, eh, I want to upgrade Vault, to the moment that we're running that version of our production machines, 30 freaking minutes. And literally last night, I was, uh, I was scaling out a last church with some of uh, my coworkers. It took all day. We were up till like 3 in the morning. Things, you know, pulling our hair out. We weren't even upgrading anything. We were just adding notes to it. Uh, I couldn't imagine doing this with my sequel. So for such a critical part of the structure, it's really fantastic to do it for us as well as the uh, stretch. And kind of uh, touching on another point from Armin here, secrets are hard, and uh, we, we haven't really set ourselves up for a whole bunch of success in Slack either, mainly because we tightly protect the secrets. Uh, we look, uh, we strongly audit any access of, uh, to the Tempafest in friendly directions. If something unexpected touches it, they're getting alerted, uh, and we're going to know this, we're going to go talk. Uh, also, no machines, we've never allowed any machine to have list access on a bucket. If you don't know the secret that you need, you're not going to be able to list and find it out. Uh, and going back to the SecOps environment earlier, there's only a handful of us that can actually administer these things. So it's very much a black box to the rest of Slack. Uh, and we're mostly okay with that. We don't want to have to go through all the pain of rotating those credentials again because we have you know, some lax days of policies around how to how to manage access to these things. But you know, the vault makes it better, and uh, I'm glad we're using it. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm after or now. I, I can ask you either way. No, it, it, um, that's fine. So the question I have is <clears throat> around the upgrade scenario. Huh. It sounded like you'd launch a new cluster with the new set of servers on the side, yep. no. sanity test it, and then somehow swap it out. What I'm wondering. Oh, no. Uh, no, not necessarily. So we do uh, like a rolling, a rolling update. Since Vault can only have one master, yeah. we'll take all the non-masters down and upgrade them, and then do the master. That's a that's a last step. Uh, we don't we don't actually like to flip the. Um, got it. And then there's, and it's, it's always backwards compatible where there's never a case that, um, yeah, I, I guess if you're upgrading the master last, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't, I can't recall any situation where they broke backwards compatible, but if they did, then you uh, if I recall console broke backwards compatibility one point, <laughs> so that, you know, we had to be a little bit more searchable on that upgrade. Um, but the way that we've done all of this stuff, we're really isolated from, uh, from a uh, vault failure. And so it vaults down with the TEPFS. Uh, you know, the credentials are still there. The infrastructure still runs as it should and while we're bringing vault back up. That's for very nice to And that one last question on that last step of upgrading the last master. Is that a swap at that point, or do you actually apply the upgrade to the remaining? Uh, we just reboot it. Okay. So we install vault on all these machines, we the processes one by one, and lock, let it go. Last step is it has a new leader election. Thank you. Usually, where we find these issues. That's it. Oh, running Vault in multiple data centers, and are you doing any kind of replication? Uh, not yet. And I'm kind of glad that we had embarked on that path given what we just talked about today. Like it's been a great 